So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first of the um, academic series that we have. Um, today is a real highlight of the uh, the diverse breadth of um, of uh, the, the, cha the strengths that we have at Hughes Hall. And um, first up is going to be uh, Tom, and he's going to be talking about building uh, materials from uh, natural sources. So, please go. Okay. Hi, yes, I'm Tom Reynolds. I'm, um, I'm a, I have a structural engineering background. I'm based in the Department of Architecture. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, how we can make modern building structures from plant materials. Um, I use the, the first title, it's about the, it's about the three little pigs, and I'm not entirely sure how universal a cultural reference that is, so I'll <laughs> start with a quick one on that. So the, the story of the three little pigs says that there are three little pigs, and they built, they each built a house, and one, pi one pig built his house out of straw, um, one out of wood, and one out of bricks, and a wolf came along to attack the pigs, he tried to blow the houses down, um, he successfully blew down the straw and wooden houses, but all the other pigs sheltered in the brick house. So what I'm going to present is, is perhaps that um, this old story might not contain as much truth as it, as it might seem. Um, this is one of the outputs of my, uh, of my group over the last year. So one of the, one of the projects um, that I've been indirectly involved in, in is working with um, practicing architects and structural engineers to develop broadly feasible designs for very tall wooden buildings. So this is a 200 metre tall skyscraper um, in the city of London. Um, so we're, we're starting to show that this, that this kind of thing might be possible. But is it, is it something that's worth doing? Well, first of all, the research is based on the idea that, that we, we live in an increasingly urbanising world. And so we, it, as, we, as we try to accommodate the people that move into cities, um, we'll need to uh, come up with sustainable ways of doing that. Um, because it's a global problem, we need a global resource to deal, to deal with it. Um, and I'll, I'll try and illustrate that with wood as a structural material for that for that purpose. So here's a, here's a building that I've done some, some research work on and it's a, it's a seven storey timber building. Um, and these buildings use about 30 metres cubed of timber for each apartment with, which, with two people in. And for, for the sake of argument, let's say that um, this building will stand for 70 years and then we'll, we'll knock it down and build another one. Um, Canada, over that 70 year period, um, will produce, at its current rate of timber production, will produce 15 billion metres cubed of timber. So Canada alone produces enough wood to continuously house a billion people. So we've got a material that can make quite a, quite a big impact to housing a growing population. Um, and bamboo is quite complementary in this sense in that um, there is often quite a large resource of bamboo um, where, there's, where there is not such a big sustainable timber resource. I've realised I should have said, we don't do research on straw buildings to complete the three, the three little pigs um, uh, link, but we do research on another building material from the grass family, which is bamboo, and which has great potential. So there's, a, so there's enough, there is perhaps enough resource there to make a, di make a difference, but is it, is it any good, is it any use? So in terms of the structural properties of these materials, we might be interested in their strength and stiffness for, for building. And if we, look at, if we look at those properties in their, in their basic terms and compare them with the materials that we build most of our large buildings from, steel and reinforced concrete, we see that steel is far ahead of our wood and bamboo and that concrete is, is slightly better. But in a large building, a large proportion of the force that it resists is its own self-weight. And so, so a useful measure of how efficient a building, is, a building material is for a large building is the, is the strength to weight ratio or the stiffness to weight, weight ratio which, is plotted on, which are plotted on this graph. And by this measure, um, softwood is now, is now comparable to, with steel 
Um, and bamboo has, has unique and different properties. So I thought um, I should also give you an impression, a kind of mental picture of what these, what these materials look like in modern building structures. And most of the examples are for wood. So um, this is a, a student residence building under construction, and these are cross-laminated timber panels. So they're made from they're, they're big, thick, heavy timber panels that are made by gluing together lots of strips of timber taken from the tree. And so we can make pa panels like that, which form structural walls. But we can, we can also make big um, structural beams and columns and bracing elements. Um, and these, so this is, this is quite a feature to have this, this big piece of timber going through your, through your apartment and, it, and one might say that it wouldn't always be desirable. But this building in Norway, I don't know if it says something about the, the Norwegians' attitude to timber, but these, it was only on some of the floors that these, these bracing elements were going through the apartments and they were, these apartments were selling for more than the, than the other ones. Um, so that, that picture was taken from inside this building. So this is the, the tallest modern timber building in the world at the moment. And um, it's been the subject of some of my research because it's a pioneering building to try and find out, find out how it's behaving and how we can use it to inform the design of other future building structures. But my research also works down at this scale. And this is... This is the, the model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, um, and it has some woody cells. So, it's, so we can do some things that I'll talk about in a minute, which are useful for our understanding of, of wood and bamboo, which also has woody cells in. So let's work our way down through the scales to under, understand the, the structure of the material. So we, we start with a picture of some wood. If we look in much more closely, then we'll see that, that it is made up of this, this cellular structure and all the strong material is grouped around the cells. And if we, if we got inside one of those cells and looked at the wall with our kind of molecular goggles on, then my colleagues in biochemistry tell me that we'd see something like this. So we would see these orange chains of cellulose, which are the, the fundamentally strong molecules in there. Um, we see the, they would be surrounded by these blobs of amorphous or disordered lignin in brown, which shows how, which controls how the material interacts with water. And then that we'd we'd have these other chain molecules in grey, called which we call hemicelluloses. Um, and it's then that we're particularly finding out that they 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 play a subtle but important role. Um, so, this, so here's Arabidopsis thaliana again, the model plant, and it's useful to us because the biochemists can genetically modify it to, to add and remove molecules from, this, from that cell wall picture that I've shown um, by genetic means. And so that enables us then to do structural tests uh, and see what those molecules are contributing. Um, and so from the... From the uh, the tree trunk we've got down to the this the the cross section of the stem, and here are those here's that cellular structure again around the cross section of that of that plant stem, and we stick little cardboard frames around the plant stem so that we can safely cut it and get it into the loading machine, and then we cut the cardboard frame and then we can break the stems, and what we've been finding is that those those hemicelluloses play an important role in how much deformation the stem can um, tolerate before breaking and that's something that's really important in, um, in connections in, in large structures from these plant materials. So because, because where we use a nail or a screw or a bolt or a dowel, these steel connectors to go through um, and connect the material together, there are high stresses and high movements around, around there. Um, and so that's been one part of my research is lo looking at those, those, looking very closely around that hole where we put the put the steel through, at uh, what's going on in the material. And this is the first introduction of a bit of bamboo here. So this is a this is a bamboo specimen again, laminated strips taken from the bamboo and glued <coughs> together to make a big piece 
that we can use structurally. Um, and this is, in this type of test, we've used um, optical methods. We've taken digital images um, of the specimen as we apply a force, and then we've we've analysed those images to see where the greatest movement is, where the greatest strains are. And so that's what this heat map shows. And what we found is that is that timber and bamboo are really quite different in that um, in that behaviour. So this is the this is a, a microscope image of the edge of a, of a, the hole in a in a piece of timber, and you can see that the these generally vertical uh, vertically running cells in the timber uh, have been crushed and buckled at the at the whole edge. In bamboo, which has quite a different cellular structure, that, that doesn't happen. And that's beneficial in some ways in that it doesn't move so much and it's, um, it's a more stiff connection. But it can also, be, it, it can also fracture more readily because, because it doesn't have that movement to, to, dissipate, the, um, to dissipate the forces. And so we, we see these different, this different formation of cracks and fractures in the two different materials. And so then I've, carry, I've carried on looking very closely at the, um, at the way the material fractures and the, the way the cracks progress through the material. I'm focusing particularly on bamboo in this because this is, um, it is a, we've, been, we've been studying wood for hundreds if not thousands of years for these, these kind of structural uses. But bam, um, using bamboo in this form is quite a, is quite a new thing. We'll carry on working up through the through the scales from the from the connections in the material. I've also done work on um, on full scale multi story tests on these big wood panels. So here we we built um, two stories of walls of walls in the building research establishment's large structures lab in Watford, and we could push these walls over and find find out at what point they break. Um, and how they might behave as part of a building. As I said, it's really um, important because we're building, because these, these pioneering new buildings are being built, and there is almost a taller timber building every year at the moment, we need to measure how the buildings themselves are behaving. And generally, the building owners don't, don't take kindly to us try, even trying to push them over a little bit. <laughs> so, so the techniques I, I have been using been around measuring how the building moves under the ambient wind load. So we put a series of accelerometers all around the building and just, just measure how it moves from the day-to-day -day wind. And the result of that is very disordered random data um, because the, the building's moving, moving back and forth in, in response to a random wind load. But there are some things that we know about the randomness in the wind load that enable us to apply some statistical techniques and gradually bring order out of that randomness and that's what this animation is showing is that by a sequence of averaging we go from that randomness to something which shows us a natural frequency of the building that the building wants to move in and a rate of decay of that um, of that vibration and these give us really important clues to the structural behavior of the building without causing it any damage. Um, I thought I'd, I'd uh, put in a few, a, f a few bits and pieces about um, acknowledging that, that this isn't a new subject and that we're, we're not, in some ways, we're not even pushing the boundaries of what can be done with timber at the moment. So this, this building is almost a thousand years old. It's the, it's the, the pagoda of the Fugong Temple near Beijing in China. Um, and it's it's taller than the uh, that multi, that fourteen story Norwegian building that I showed you earlier, and it stood through several major earthquakes, and it is entirely made of timber. It doesn't have even any metal connectors. Um, we this got us into the idea of th thinking more about these traditional construction techniques and what we might learn, um, and that that brought us via a. Uh, a fortuitous conversation to a um, to this festival. Uh, so th this festival in Japan uh, 
has these floats, which are essentially three-storey timber buildings on wheels, which they race toward one another at running pace and crash into each other, ideally through these wooden rams, but not always. And, um, and these timber structures can dissipate the energy and can, can absorb the energy of that impact, albeit in modern days with some steel additions. But we're, so we're working along with a, a cultural heritage organisation in Japan to try and, try and bring out some of what there might be in those traditional details which we could, we could incorporate into modern structures. So I hope I've, I've covered a bit about um, the range of scales and the, the range of times that, we've, uh, that I've been researching over the past couple of years. I'd be happy to take any questions. I'd like to attach one of those rigs to those uh, those structures in Japan and see yeah. what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that's what we so what we've done so far is we're working with a, a Japanese university who were keen to try out their optical measurement system. They've taken high speed videos and put um, put visual targets all over them, which might be the which might be the best way to deal with it because the uh, because the um, the movements will be so big. So um, yeah, so we're we're, uh, we're waiting to get that high speed video data through and see when we're at the end of that. So I noticed that building in Norway was next to the river, so that I guess points out another advantage of wooden buildings if it falls over, it floats. <laughs> <laughs> but when I moved to Britain, one of the things that was really surprising to me was how few wooden buildings I saw. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was given was because they were afraid of fire. Great London fire. Was yeah. There. And so that uh, a concern about wooden buildings, which maybe you could address. And the other thing is plywood's been around a long time. And mm -hmm. I grew up around plywood in Seattle. And now I learned that all that uh, formalin that I was uh, breathing and formaldehyde that was dissipated from the plywood is going to shorten my life span by at least 60 years. Yeah. So the question is how do you deal with that in your community? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, so. So I'll start with the fire question. Um, so I would, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that when it comes to buildings like the 200 metre tall one that I showed at the start, that is very much an ongoing area of research. Um, the, I suppose the, the thing that isn't intuitive about fire in, in wood is that, especially when we get up to these these really large um, cross sections, these really large members that, that are in these modern buildings, is that they, um, they, can with, they can withstand a fire for a very long time because they, because they char from the outside and that char is actually quite a good insulator to stop the heat getting into the centre. Um, these, lar these large timber beams perform far better, for example, in a steel beam, which would, which conducts heat very quickly through it, through it and softens and eventually melts under the temperature. You don't, you don't get that same rapid deterioration in timber. You get something that is gradual and predictable, but there is a fundamental difference in the timber burns and steel, steel and concrete don't. And that's what we're, we're working with fire engineers on understanding more about how that um, how that affects, especially in very large buildings where the time to the time to put out fire might be much longer. How that how that affects things. Um, so yeah, so that's a fire question. And, and these these resins and the compounds that they release is um, is something that is that is developing. Most of these. Uh, you know, it's not an area of expertise for me, but but most of these um, large timber elements will be now made with formal, formaldehyde-free resins, and they are and they are. Um, we we hope that the that the longer term uh, consequences of those are, are better than the formaldehyde ones. We promise not to expire right now. <laughs> <laughs>
And you said that uh, using steel bolts uh, caused considerable strain around the, the hole uh, yes. when joining panels. What happens if you just use wooden kind of hoods, yeah. I mean, like dowels or something like that? Would, would that not be just as effective or are they just too weak? Yeah, so they're. they're um, there have been other researchers in my in my previous institution in, in Bath had got some really good results from um, from uh, using more traditional con connection techniques with big timber pegs um, and also using other softer materials like um, like fiber reinforced polymers to try and do the job and it seems like a really promising area. There's I think there's a lot in this that. There are se there's centuries of experience that there are bits that we'll be able to pick out of. But the Chinese, so the, the temple in China, was presumably that, that was using wooden uh, Yeah, so, th so that's all actually all interlocking pieces. Yes, they did. The so they didn't, even, they didn't yeah. even have any holes cut through things. Or everything's stacked and yeah. interlocking. It's, a, they're, it's amazing the structure of these yeah. things. So that's, and that's part of why it dissipates energy so well in earthquakes, that everything's rubbing against, rubbing and colliding against one another, we think that's good. Tom, thank you. Please continue the conversation with some wine and cheese afterwards. <laughs>